Leadership is important. Leadership can be encouraging, life-giving, and supportive, or it can be difficult, damaging, and dangerous. It all depends on the kind of leadership. Leadership always makes a difference one way or another. It takes you in one direction or another. And if you keep up to date with the news in the evangelical world, you will know that sadly it is not unusual for leadership to falter, fail, and bring the gospel into disrepute. It's also quite difficult to know what it is that we are looking for in a leader. Are we looking for high performance gifts and abilities? Are we looking for charismatic personalities? Are we looking for uh, strategists, innovators, motivators? What is it we're to look for as we seek leaders? Thankfully, the Apostle Paul has written this letter to Titus, which gives us a clear idea of what we're to be looking for as we seek leaders. We're going to spend uh, the next three weeks looking at this letter to Titus. It's just a short letter, three weeks, and we'll cover it together. Paul and Titus had been on the island of Crete preaching the gospel, and people had responded to the gospel and come to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, the commentators reckon it was around about 60 AD, uh, and the gospel had come to the island of Crete. Paul then moved on to his next assignment, and he left Titus here in Crete, uh, continuing to nurture and support the church, and he writes to him with this task of appointing leaders, appointing elders in every town. And so this letter has much helpful instruction from an older seasoned leader to a younger leader about selecting and appointing leaders. And as we will see, it's not so much about what the leader can do as about what the leader is. It's very much about character. Now, there is a, a certain awkwardness about leaders speaking about what leaders should be. Uh, Peter and I will be bringing the teaching in this series, and I want to say to you that we are very aware of our limitations and our shortcomings. Our weaknesses and our failures are before us, and I'm sure that's the case for all of the elder team. And yet, as we approach this passage of Holy Scripture, we recognize that this is the kind of men that we want to be, that we aim to be. But before we dive into the passage, let me make some preliminary observations. This passage is about appointing biblical leaders in the church, but we must always remember that Christ is the head of the church which is His precious bride. The Lord Jesus Christ is the ultimate leader of the church. He is the supreme leader of the church. And Paul speaks about this in his letter to the Ephesians in the context of uh, husband and wife relationships. He says in Ephesians 5 and 23, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, His body, and is Himself its Savior. As we think about uh, Christian leadership, we need to remember that Christ is the head of the church, His body, of which He is the Savior. We also need to recognize that the church is not some kind of organization, but rather it is more akin to an organism. It's not a business corporation with its standing orders and rules and annual reports. It's a living organism of people who together are the body of Christ. The church is living. The church is moving. The church is breathing. The key is that we are gathered together in community. We are not a corporation. We also need to recognize that all members of the church of Jesus Christ, all members are called to be priests and ministers. There is no hierarchy of importance and significance. Every one of us who are part of the blood-bought church of Jesus Christ are called to serve as priests and ministers. If you want to see that more clearly, have a look at 1 Peter, 1 Peter chapter 2, 
verse 9, we have uh, that verse, but you are a chosen race. Speaking to the people of God, Peter says, you are a chosen race. You are a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Every member has a role as a priest and a minister who declares the praises of him who called us out of darkness. There are no spectators, there are no bit players, there are no irrelevancies, there are no passengers in the church of Jesus Christ. We are all called to be priests and ministers of Christ's church. Having said all of this, God has called some to feed and lead the people of God with servant-hearted leadership. Within the body of priests and ministers, headed by Christ Himself, God calls some to feed and lead the people of God. Hebrews 13, verse 7, remember your leaders, those who spoke to you the Word of God, consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Now, some of you might have listened to this introduction and now be thinking to yourself, well, I'm not a leader. I don't need to listen to this. I can switch off and have a wee 40 winks because I was up late last night and I could do with a wee rest. I don't need to listen to any of this. I'm not a leader. That would be a major mistake because on one level, every one of us who are part of the body of Christ is called to embody and live out these positive things in this passage and we are all also called to flee from the negative. So there's an implication, an application of this to us all, regardless of whether we serve in any form of leadership or not. There are also many different ways of being a leader. Not all will be elders, but many will exercise all sorts of other kinds of leadership, perhaps as a growth group leader, or as a kids' church leader, or as a youth leader, all sorts of other leaders in the church and and so there are things for us all to learn and be challenged by. On top of all of that, you are the people who select the leaders of the church. Well, those of you who are members of the church are. You have a critical part to play in identifying leaders, in appointing leaders. And so it's really important that we all know what it is that we are supposed to be looking for as we set apart leaders so let's dive in and see what the Lord has for us here in Titus. In the opening few verses, Paul gives a, a rather long uh, introduction. He says, Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, for the sake of the faith of God's elect and their knowledge of the truth which accords with godliness in hope of eternal life, which God, who never lies, promised before the ages began and at the proper time, manifested in his word through the preaching with which I have been entrusted by the command of God our Savior. To Titus, my true child in a common faith, grace and peace from God the Father in Christ Jesus our Savior. Paul gives a sense of who he is and who the people being entrusted to Timothy are. Paul is a servant of God. He is an apostle of Christ Jesus. And these people that are being entrusted to to Titus. These people are God's elect, people who have a faith and a knowledge resting on the one hope of eternal life. These people are the elect of God who, through faith in Jesus Christ, have come into the family of God. They are a very precious people indeed. And these very precious people have been entrusted uh, to to, to someone who is called by God to feed and to lead the people of God in servant-hearted leadership. It's that wider context that Paul writes to Titus. Paul had given Titus a job. We see that in verse 5 of our passage. This is why I left you in Crete, says Paul, so that you might put right what remained in order and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. Titus was really what you might call a one-man vacancy committee. His job was to appoint elders in every town just as Paul had directed him. And notice, elders, plural, team leadership in every town. And then Paul goes on to tell him 
what kind of man he should be looking for, what kind of men he should be seeking to engage in leading the people of God. And the first thing he turns to is the leader's character. When you read through this section, this list, and find words like above reproach, in some translations, I think if you're using the NIV, you might find the word blameless. When you read through this and find these words above reproach and blameless, it would put anyone off from being a leader because clearly none of us are blameless or entirely above reproach if you define that word as being without sin or never wrong. But without sin, never wrong cannot be what it means since none of us is without sin. I think we get a strong hint as to what it means if we read down through from verse 7 on and we get this list of vices and virtues. Verse 7 says, for an overseer as God's steward must be above reproach. He must not be arrogant or quick-tempered or a drunkard or violent or greedy for gain, but hospitable, a lover of good, self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. I think verses 7 and 8 essentially form a definition of what it means by above reproach or blameless, depending on the translation that you are using. It means that the leader will not be overbearing, will not be slave driving, will not be harsh and heavy-handed. It means that he will not be quick-tempered, flying off the handle, left, right, and center. It means that he won't be given to drunkenness. It means he won't be violent or dodgy, seeking after personal gain using dishonest means. Godly leaders won't be like this. But then in verse 8, Paul lists the sorts of positive attributes that will characterize or should characterize the leader in God's church. He will be hospitable, friendly, with an open home and an open heart, someone who wants to connect with people, someone who is happy around people and who people are happy being around. He will be someone who loves what is good. He will have a hunger for what is good and upright and true. He will be committed to what is good and will flee from what is evil. He should be someone who is self-controlled and disciplined. He should have a handle on himself. He will have a hold of his tongue. He will have a harness on his heart. He will be self-controlled and disciplined in his ways. He will be holy and upright. He should come across to you as someone who is a sound man of God, seeking that Christ might increase in his life while he himself might decrease. He will be growing in holiness. Now, any of us sitting or standing here in this place today and thinking to themselves, sounds like me. I think if we're thinking like that, it probably excludes us from the role. Because as you think about these vices and virtues, with any degree of depth as you think about them, then it should drive all of us to the question that it drives me. Who could be such a man? Who could be such a person? It's a high standard. And people will probably recognize it in a man, whereas the man himself who knows the sin of his heart won't. If you're looking for a leader, then this is the kind of man that you're looking for. This is the kind of character that your elders are seeking to cultivate in their lives and are encouraging each other in their lives and will continue to work on in their lives. This is the leader's character. But this is also the character that each one of us should be seeking after and building into our lives. After all, none of these things are are things that, that the leader should strive for, but everybody else can forget about. That's not what, what it means. We should all be seeking to live like this and to cultivating this kind of character in our lives. If you're thinking about leading the people, then you need a leader's character. If you're looking for a leader, then you need someone with the, this kind of leader's character. 
Second thing to have consideration of is the leader's family. Verse 6 says, This is why I left you in Crete, so that you might put what remained into order and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. If anyone is above reproach, the husband of one wife and his children are believers and are not open to the charge of debauchery or insubordination. Well, here Paul focuses on the family life of the man who would be elder, the man who would be leader. Paul is looking for an above reproach home life, not a perfect home life. No one has that, and, and he defines a little of what this looks like. Firstly, there is the reference to the man's marriage relationship. He should be the husband of one wife. Does he only have one wife? Well, at the moment in the UK, polygamy is illegal, but who knows what the future holds. But this isn't only about polygamy. It's about faithfulness to his wife. Is he a faithful husband? Is he a, a one-woman man? There is no string of broken-hearted women in his background. Does he have a, a track record of commitment and steadiness and faithfulness to his one wife? I don't think this implies that single men cannot serve in leadership, but if a single man does serve in leadership, then his interaction with women should be wholesome and appropriate. He should have control of himself. His children should be believers. That's, that is the potential. Elder should be the kind of person whose children have followed him in adopting the faith. Now, don't forget, these are principles for appointing leaders, but family circumstances vary so very much. There are children who grow up following the faith of their fathers. Then when they've grown up, grow, they grow cold, they wander away, they walk their own path. There are fathers who come to faith later in life and their children have been following a different model. And so it's so tough then to remodel a new biblical way. All sorts of things impact the family as the years wear on. But the general principle is that the faith of the father should be found in the lives of the child. The potential leader's children should have a concern for good works, for good behavior. They should not be committed to debauchery. They should not be out of control. The general principle here is that the elder should be a man who's capable of managing his own family, a man who's capable of leading his own family. And a good look at a man's home life will tell you much about his character and about his ability to give leadership to the church. Now, of course, family life has many ups and downs. No one has the perfect family. No one uh, escapes the twists and turns of difficulties in family lives. It can be scary at times having kids, bringing up kids uh, and encouraging them to, to, to make good choices. Sometimes the kids make good choices and sometimes they make bad choices. And sometimes they follow us and take our counsel and sometimes they rebel and reject our counsel. It's a very difficult job raising a family. So it's about looking at this in the round. Does the man seem to manage his family well? If he does, then there's a fair chance that with God's help, he'll be able to manage God's family well. So Paul has directed Titus to appoint elders in every town in Crete, and he's given him some guidelines about the kind of men he's looking for, focusing on the leader's character, the leader's family. And then he turns to the leader's task, You've got to evaluate a potential leader against the task that you're asking him to do. In verse 9, Paul is very clear about what this task is. The task is not to entertain the people. The task is not to be a motivational coach. The task is not jumping to the people's every demand. The task is not to run to the agenda of the one who shouts the loudest. The task is not to run a social club or a care home or a respite center. Look at verse 9 and you'll see what the task is. He must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught so that he may be able to give instruction in sound doctrine and also to rebuke those who contradict it. There are three tasks here that are identified as the leader's tasks by Paul. 
Titus, as he goes around the church in Crete, is to be looking for men who have the appropriate character, convictions, and competence to take on these three tasks. Task one is to hold firmly to the trustworthy word as it has been taught. The leader must be devoted to the gospel, to the word of God. He must be unshakably committed to sound doctrine. He is to hold firmly to it. And that holding firmly takes energy and it takes commitment and it takes courage. At times, the hands will become calloused. At times, the energy levels will wane. But through all, the leader of the people must hold firmly to the trustworthy message. What is that message? It is the Word of God. It is the gospel of God. It is the body of teaching that we find in this book. Now, granted, it's unusual to come across potential leaders who say that they don't want to hold firmly uh, to this word. They all say that they will hold firmly. But the big question is, what is it actually that they're going to hold firmly to? They must hold firmly to the Word of God, the trustworthy message as it has been taught. We need to learn from those who have gone before us. We, we, uh, we do not have the freedom to abandon all that has been learned and handed down about God's Word. And there are some very obvious examples in our society today. If you've been following the twists and turns of the Church of England, you will see that many in that denomination have refused to hold firmly to the trustworthy word as taught. Just a couple of weeks ago, I think, the Archbishop of Canterbury himself appeared on the Rest is Politics podcast with Alistair Campbell and Rory Stewart and said that he no longer believed in the biblical teaching on sexual ethics. He denied the Bible's teaching. He denied the official teaching of the church he claims to lead, and yet he is still there. Really, they need to sack Canterbury and put the communion under the leadership of one of the African archbishops who actually believes the Bible. At a more local level, there are plenty of churches in Glasgow that, that have basically given up on the trustworthy message and operate as community centers or pseudo-social work hubs, good deeds, but no gospel message. Most of these leaders would say that they hold to the trustworthy message, but you've got to look closer. We're not free to change the message. We're not free to update the message to fit the demands of 21st century Westerners. We hold to the trustworthy message as taught. A potential leader might say that they hold to the hold firm to the trustworthy message as taught, but in order to, to discover the truth, you need to question, you need to look, you need to listen to what is being taught, you need to weigh it up against Scripture, not against whether you like it or not, not against whether you're entertained by it or not, or amused by it or not, but weigh it up against Scripture. Is it true? Is it consistent with the biblical teaching? So, task one of the leader of the people is to hold firmly to the trustworthy word as it has been taught. Task two is to give instruction in sound doctrine. The reason for this holding firm of the trustworthy word is so that the leader of the people can encourage the people giving instruction in sound doctrine. Again, if you're reading from the NIV this morning, you'll see that the section is translated as encourage in sound doctrine. And that, that is good in one sense, we want to be encouraging, but it can also be a little misleading given what we mean in the modern day by encouragement. In the modern day, we tend to think of encouragement as kind of cheerleading, a sort of pat on the back, tell them they're doing well. We, we tend to mean value everything that everyone says and don't be directive in any way, for if you be directive, that might be a little bit discouraging. We mean listen, smile, nod, affirm, whatever it is that's coming out of the person's mouth, that tends to be what our world means by encouragement. But that's not at all what Paul means by encourage others by sound doctrine. The ESV is better, I think. It says give instruction. But, but perhaps better still might be the word exhort. 
I, I think it's a, a better word because it has that sense of encouragement, but it also conveys the urgency of the task and the stakes that are at play. What Paul is looking for is, in a leader is someone who will urge the people on in sound doctrine. And sometimes that can be quite directive. Sometimes that can mean saying things that people don't want to hear, things that might often be misunderstood, even willfully misunderstood. Paul wants leaders who take sound doctrine and speak it with an urgency into the many situations of everyday life that the people are facing. And believe me, it's not easy. So task one is hold firmly to the trustworthy word as it's been taught. Task two is to take this trustworthy word and use it to exhort, instruct the people in sound doctrine. Task three is to rebuke those who contradict it. Paul wants leaders who are prepared to stand up and refute, who are prepared to stand up and rebuke those who oppose sound doctrine, those who are not holding firmly to the trustworthy message, those who contradict the Word. And from verse 10 on in the chapter, he, he explains and illustrates why that's necessary. If you look at verse 10 on, you'll see it. There were many there who were insubordinate, empty talkers, deceivers, particularly a group who were trying to bind the believers to the Jewish laws and customs of circumcision. They were teaching falsehood, and they needed to be rebuked. They needed to be challenged. They were upsetting families. Some of them who were there were teaching for shameful gain, verse 11. And some of them were illustrating the cultural stereotype that Cretans or Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons, verse 12. I suspect that if Paul were alive today, he would be running the risk of getting cancelled for indulging in cultural stereotyping. I think that what he's saying is that this is the cultural stereotype and these guys are illustrating it amply. This is countercultural. We're supposed to value everyone, value everyone, value everyone's viewpoint, value every idea, value every perspective. But the true leader of the people of God cannot sit and listen to falsehood being spread, cannot stand by and watch heresy being propagated, cannot stand back and allow diverse and divergent views to be equally esteemed in the church of Jesus Christ. The true leader of the people of God needs to be prepared to refute those who oppose sound doctrine. He needs to be equipped to refute those who oppose fruit, eh, sound doctrine and needs to be prepared for the flack that comes from refuting those who oppose sound doctrine. This is perhaps one of the most difficult aspects of the job of the leader. Verse 13, Paul says to Titus, rebuke them sharply. Why? That they may be sound in the faith. The aim is still for, to, to help the one who is in error. Rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith. And that's hard. We see in verse 16 that there were those who professed to know God. They professed to know God, but they denied Him by their works. The loving thing in that situation is to challenge that. It's to rebuke that and refute that error, and it's not easy. The leader's task can be a challenging one indeed, because the leader himself is sinful, frail, a faulty man, and yet here he is charged with this high calling indeed to hold firmly to the trustworthy word as it's been taught, to take this trustworthy word and to use it to instruct and exhort the people by sound doctrine and to rebuke those who oppose sound doctrine. Leading God's people is a high calling indeed. Paul was very aware of the importance and the significance of the task, and so he was keen to give clear instructions to Titus about the kind of men that he was looking for in the churches in Crete. He had to go from town to town, church to church, and appoint elders as Paul directed him. What was he looking for? He was looking for character. He was looking for the leader's family, looking at the leader's task and the ability of these men to uh, perform it. And so as we bring all of this to a close, what do, we, what do we do with it? What do we, 
How do we apply it? How do we make it make a difference in our lives? Well, all of these virtues that are expressed here, we all ought to be seeking after them in our lives. We all ought to be cultivating them in our lives. All of these vices that are illustrated, we flee from them. Every one of us, we turn our backs from them and we flee from them. We would ask you to pray for your leaders. Pray that, that, that God would work these things in our lives and, and help us with the areas in which we struggle. Pray for your leaders and ask that God would build this kind of character into us. And pray that the Lord would raise up further leaders, future leaders, that he might identify leaders among us, that God's church would be looked after well. Paul gave good advice, and it's still relevant today. Lord, help us in that task. Let's pray. Precious Father, we are humbled as we read a passage like this, as we read it and consider it, we recognize how far short we fall. We see our struggles. Our hope is in Jesus. We pray that by the power of your Holy Spirit, you would work these things in all of our lives. May none of us be arrogant or quick-tempered. May we all flee from drunkenness and violence and greed. By the power of your Spirit, in your grace, make us hospitable. Make us lovers of good. Give us the ability to be increasingly self-controlled. May we be upright. May we grow in holiness and discipline. And may every one of us hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught. Left our own devices, we will make a huge mess of this, Lord. Come by your Spirit and help us. Make us into the men and women that you want us to be. This we pray in Jesus' mighty name. Amen.